job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So, what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies. Hello everyone and welcome to another day of Rear Developers Live. Uh, I am Seat and we are broadcasting directly from our beautiful studio in Talent Garden Vienna. We have nice weather here. Uh, you can't see it but you can believe me and you can also believe me that today we have a very special edition of Rear Developers Live. We will talk about quantum computing, about the impact of hackathons on society and we will start the day off with a morning show discussing some really crazy and cool topics with our friends from IBM. We will come back to that in a minute, but before we start, I want to drive your attention to the Real Developers World Congress. And yes, you heard it right, the Real Developers World Congress is coming back to you this year with an online edition. It takes place from June 28 to July 1st and we have a really, really, really cool speaker lineup for you. So we have uh, none other than the inventor of the World Wide Web, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. We have Jeff Atwood, aka Coding Hover, the co-founder of Stack Overflow. We have John and Brenda Romero joining us, the legends from the gaming industry. And we have Mishko Heavery, who is the creator of Angular and uh, AngularJS. He's also confirmed together with many, many, many others. So make sure to get your early bird tickets now and mark the date in your calendar, June 28th to July 1st, a four day online conference, Rio Developers World Congress. So, and with that said for today, as always, please, very important, comply with our code of conduct. It means that we need to be nice to each other, treat everyone with respect. Here's a short video for explanation. Okay, with that said, let's start with our morning show. I am very happy that we could manage to get on our, our friends of IBM to join us in a direct line from different places around the world. Um, I'm happy to say welcome to Sebastian who will help me navigate through this day. We will talk about a lot of different uh, topics, but let's get Sebastian on stage first. So Sebastian, hi, how are you? Hi, good morning everybody. Good morning, Seat. Uh, I'm doing very well. How are you? Good, good. As I said, nice weather, everything fine. I hope it stays the next days uh, the same uh, as it is now. Um, Sebastian, for the ones who don't know you, maybe you can give us a short introduction. What are you doing? What's your topics? Uh, are you a developer? Um, what did you do in life? And so on and so on. All right, thanks. Yeah, uh, well, about myself, I'm um, 42 years of age. Um, I started my uh, my IT my IT career uh, 20, 20, 20 plus years ago uh, as a software developer for the Metro Group, and then you know uh, quite a long journey um, across um, across milestones like product management and uh, go to market and consulting, and then um, I would say sort of back to the roots uh, at IBM. I'm responsible for developer advocacy and for um, co-development and build projects. So today I would say, you know, back to where I have been like 20 years ago, um, or tighter close to the uh, developer community. Okay, thanks Sebastian. Before we maybe talk a bit about the topic of developer advocacy and the importance of it, um, maybe um, can you tell us what we are going to see and uh, who we are going to meet today and what topics will we address? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, so for today, we really prepared, uh, I would say, sort of a, a speed dating uh, across uh, multiple um, IBM areas. So um, we're going to, of course, look into um, the developer community and what we do for the community. So we're going to have Niklas um, explaining to us what developer advocacy means, what uh, co-development means as sort of the uh, we call it the hybrid cloud build projects because uh, as you might know we um, emphasize very strong on, on hybrid cloud multi-cloud and data and ai um, so we're going to look into this um, then we're gonna um, also discuss the, the world's largest social hackathon good tech hackathon it's called call for code um, it's in its fourth year this time uh, we do it together with the united nations with the clips foundation for instance and miriam will explain a little bit about the call for code um, this year um, then we're gonna um, discuss the code at think um, the thing is IBM's largest conference, um, super tech oriented, of course, with more than 200 uh, sessions. And um, we're going to explain a little bit about the code at Think then, uh, what it means, because you can also get certified within technologies by joining the sessions. Um, we also have a very nice showcase today, um, the IBM Watson Center. Um, Francis from the IBM Watson Center will be with us today and showcasing us a little bit around self-driving cars. So a little bit more that uh, not everybody knows about IBM, that we are in the space uh, also. Um, also, we're going to uh, uh, discuss our or talk, uh, look in our vending machine. Our vending machine is uh, one thing that really gets you some some nice goodies like like so cool socks and, and T-shirts, right, with our super Super cool uh, IBM logo to your home because it's I mean it's distant uh, it's distant eventing but we want to like to give you some goodies anyway so the vending machine coming up later and then um, we're gonna also have Julia joining from the weather company um, and explaining us more about weather data data IoT yeah um, and uh, then we're gonna have some nice talks uh, yeah so I guess it, it's really full of full of um, very interesting topics today and yeah I hope you're gonna like it the same as we do today. Okay, so obviously I know a bit about it from the preparation, so looking forward uh, to that one. It's going to be intensive. Uh, we have only 30 minutes, but I think that we can make that. Um, let's basically start with the first topic. Let's talk a bit about developer advocacy. So as you are a developer advocate and at, at IBM, um, I would like to ask you how does your day-to-day -day, uh, work look like? What does developer advocacy mean to you? Um, how, how is it used at IBM to basically also help the outside world and get feedback from the outside world and implement it in your products that you do. And yeah, maybe you can just tell us a bit about that. Sure, sure. Well, um, at, IBM, at IBM, we believe in the three C's. Sometimes I also say, or we also say four C's. It's really uh, code, content, community, and I would say class, like sort of education that we bring to the table. Um, and, and we do it, you know, in, in, um, in different areas. Um, maybe if you could bring up uh, um, the one or two slides that I brought with me today, um, you can see basically within, within one, I would say one sentence what we do. Uh, we would like to, to build something amazing together. Um, at IBM, you know, we are in open source since 25 plus years, so quite a long time, but nobody knows. Um, so open source is an important pillar for us. The same is true for uh, serving serving the uh, developer community with, with the most important technologies out there. And so uh, building something together means we start with providing open source code, for instance. Then we go in and also uh, enable um, the community by providing meetups. Everybody can join these meetups. So what we do basically is helping building something together. Uh, we provide not only the, I would say, the knowledge, but also the resources. And you can see here, for instance, um, that we have um, that we have different groups, of course. So we serve the community uh, on Crowdcast. You can find all our uh, recordings there. Everything is available as replays um, immediately after the live session. That's a for that, that's an advantage. That's why that we uh, that's why we use Crowdcast, for instance. And Meetup, of course, right? You have uh, the link there for our Meetup group, so you can join. You will find out all about our upcoming events. We do 200 plus live events to a train developer a year and right so um, also the important, important piece is what I say um, is really providing learning journeys you're going to learn this today also and as I said the co-development projects and that's basically new this year and we're going to have Niklas explaining us more about these these important topics for developers uh, in a little bit okay that uh, sounds very good um, what I'm very interested in, in is uh, the topic of MVPs and basically getting a bit into the details. Um, so I would say just let, let's, let's get Niklas on stage and uh, 
yeah, because I think he can uh, go a bit deeper, right? All right, thank you. Niklas, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Seat. Hi, um, Sebastian. Hi, Niklas. Hi. Welcome. Okay, so, so yeah, let me talk. Niklas, what can you tell us? Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about what I'm actually doing, how my day-to-day -day job looks like as a developer advocate. I am Right now, I'm preparing a series of webinars around the topic application modernization, which is one of the topics which is really um, popular these days because you can save a lot of money, you can be much more agile if you use modern architectures to build new types of applications. And um, you know, technically, this is pretty challenging because you know it's related to cloud native, to microservices, to DevOps, to CI, CD. So all the topics that are being discussed among developers. Now, the main reason why I love working as a developer advocate is because I can learn new technologies like every day. And this is pretty cool because you know I, I like extending my skills. I, I like you know try out new new things. And this is also pretty important for us as developer advocates because we need to be authentic. You know, our our types of engagements are a little bit different from, let's say, the classic types of engagements or the, you know the classic marketing. We are talking to developers and partners um, from developer to developer, right? Which means for us, we need to make sure our skills stay up to date. And this is something that I do personally just by implementing applications myself. You know, this is the best way for me to learn new technologies. Just try it out, and and, and you know, and, and and then you can talk again with developers, um, educate them, discuss with them, which is again a lot of fun. So as I said, we need to to keep our skills up to date, and that's also one of the reasons why, in addition to developer advocacy, as Sebastian said, we are also um, doing partner engagements. You know, around the topics hybrid cloud on the one hand side and AI on the other hand side. So we're working together with partners. Our goal is to make them successful. We try to explain the benefits, the value from IBM offerings around OpenShift and and our cloud packs so that they actually solve the business needs of customers and partners and any types of um, you know, developers. So that's essentially what we're doing. And again, the, the topics are mostly around hybrid cloud and AI. OpenShift is the core center of everything we are doing. You know, even the new IBM offerings are all based on OpenShift. And partners and developers love it because it makes it so much easier to deploy and host applications. You know, if you use the one consistent model, and by the way, OpenShift is the um, enterprise distribution of Kubernetes. So we are using Kubernetes, but we are also adding value by you know, having our you know, own operators, our offerings, et cetera. And, and customers and partners really like, like that because it basically brings this platform as a service approach to them, which means they can focus on their business needs rather than infrastructure. So that's kind of a you know very quick summary of, of what we are doing. Again, on the one hand side is developer advocates, on the other hand side to actually build solutions, like you said, MVPs and prototypes. Um, you know, it's about co-creation. It's it's not about just you know drawing some some nice slides and architecture diagrams. It's actually helping them by writing code together, and, and that's also a lot of fun for us. Okay, thanks for the short introduction. Um, I, I would have two questions actually to both of you. So you mentioned some webinars in the beginning, some sessions mm -hmm. that you are preparing. Is that actually part of the enablement series, which I saw somewhere? And secondly, maybe a more personal question is um, something that I also often get asked, like how do you become a developer advocate at any corporate? So what's, what's the usual basically process? So the, the first answer is simple. Um, the, the, the answer is, um, you know, in the easiest case, just Google for IBM Developer Meetup Berlin, and then you will see a list of all of our meetups and webinars, or use the Crowdcast URL that you just saw on uh, Sebastian's slide. That's another alternative. Um, the second que the second question is a little bit uh, more difficult, um, and, and I think there is not the, the one simple answer. I mean, obviously, some companies have openings for developer advocates, right? Um, but sometimes, you know, it's, I mean, let's talk about may maybe me in my case, right? Um, yeah. I started to work as a developer advocate like 10 years ago. At the time, there wasn't an opening for developer advocates within IBM. I basically introduced that role by convincing my managers and they created the role and I could work in this role. So I guess it's, you know, if you are passionate about that topic, if you really want to work on it, you will find lots of opportunities. Okay, and then also maybe Sebastian, if you come back again, um, I would also uh, 
basically asked what 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 kind of developers are you addressing because you know working with IBM and so on people might think it's always about big corporates and enterprises and so on but actually uh, there is a lot of going around with startups and smaller projects uh, so maybe um, you can uh, tell us a bit like what what's the scale of the projects and what kind of developers you are addressing and so on yes yes sure sure well um, you know I mean IBM is of course shipping uh, I, I would really a lot of technologies around hybrid cloud and AI um, I mean and we are addressing with all our products, all our tech that we ship, uh, all developers out there. So, and, uh, you know, there is also not really a level that, the, I mean, if you're a beginner or if you're an intermediate or an expert level, we always say something in our in our drawer, something in our in our meetup sessions, our learning journeys that we can offer to you to learn something new. And it's really about, it, it's all types of developers, back and front end, you know, DevOps, uh, blockchain, um, AI data scientists, data engineers, security architects, cloud architects. Um, you know, we are totally, I, would, I wouldn't say nerds, sort of yes, uh, in, our, in our DNA is technology. Uh, we love technology, that's why we are here. And IBM is a technology company. And uh, that means we really focus all we do around uh, innovations. Um, be it be it like the last thing that might you have that you might have read over the social media the past days, uh, the two nanometers uh, technology for, for developing even smaller and, and more performance, performance heavy chips, 50% uh, increase in performance with these new chips. So, I mean, we we do a lot with uh, in inventing since more than 100 years. Um, this being said, so you know, we are really addressing all types of technology enthusiasts, developers of all kinds, um, and with our journeys, for instance, you know, the learning journeys that we have up and running. Um, they are focused really on getting you from a certain, I would say, beginner level along the entire year 2021 to an expert level. Um, and we have data and AI series running. Uh, it, it ran over 12 weeks. Uh, we are currently having running our application security uh, for cloud focus, of course, application security for developers running at the moment. Um, then we have an awesome series about app modernization that actually Niklas brought up, um, developed over the past months with, with, with most important uh, technologies that are out there really to move you from a monolith, for instance, or from old 10 plus years Java applications to a new cloud native state. Um, we are coming up with more like that. So Quantum is also part of that we uh, in a series that we are running at the moment. We're going to later have Jan Rainer Lahmann also talking about Quantum today. So we do, right, I mean, we cover all technologies basically and we address all developers using these technologies. Okay, that's very nice to hear. I also want to say again, like, thank you to Niklas. Um, so if Niklas is still here, uh, thank you very much and hope to see you later again. Yeah, I'm still here. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, thanks. So um, let's come to another topic that I would say is, is, is really important uh, when we talk about um, coding and projects and so on. I think that um, despite the pandemic and everything that is going on, we still live in a privileged world, right? Um, especially are in our cases. And uh, I think it's very important to also talk a bit about responsible computing, to give also something back, uh, back to the community, um, especially if you're working in, in larger corporates or as a developer anywhere, because we have also the possibilities to help um, not only financially, but also like with the things that we uh, do and also talking about, uh, let's say, um, ethics and so on. So I saw there is something, um, something uh, going around also um, at, uh, at, at IBM and uh, you have one very uh, nice person who is, who is addressing this topic, um, Miriam. So maybe we can also uh, talk a bit about that topic and, and, and yeah, call Miriam also on stage. Sebastian, yes. maybe you want also to, to add something to that. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, the, the call for code, uh, it's really a good tech initiative. Um, as I said, it's, it's a combination that we do here with, with many, many partners like the United Nations, um, the Eclipse Foundation and others. It's really focusing on social, um, I would say, you know, um, technology to improve the people's lives. And uh, um, it, it, it's in its fourth year. And this year we are addressing uh, things like zero hunger with technology, uh, how to fight water pollution. And we're gonna have Miriam expanding more details in a little bit. Um, but you know, just last year, last year we had almost half a million developers, almost 400,000 plus developers joining. That's a lot. Yeah, that's really a lot. And you know, it's, it's a worldwide thing. So, and uh, you know, it's cross geos and we also have uh, certain, certain geo winners. So what we do is then, you know, the winner gets $200,000 and we're gonna continue to finish 
the product and bring this 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 hackathon thing that, that someone did to life. You know, that's also a big difference from this hackathon to others. This good tech hackathon that we do here is really that's not only it's then at the end for the bin, but what you code, what you develop together. Um, with enjoying teams in, in, in you know diverse and totally diverse teams worldwide that you can just join and develop together we bring this to life and ship it to communities where it's needed and uh, last year we did something about covid for instance how to fight covid with with technology and this year uh, miriam can explain us a bit better what's what we're gonna uh, what yeah, challenges we have let's get miriam on stage yeah hi thank you for having me the call for code is so exciting and it's I, maybe today I could explain three ways why it is like a hackathon and three ways why it's not like a hackathon because Call for Code is actually an always running up and running platform with exactly what you said in mind, tech for good and also using um, IBM's technology, our knowledge, our resources and the call for code is the perfect way to get involved use tech for good and responsibly and also make a difference so maybe we could play the video and you can get a little teaser for what the call for code looks like there is no planet b clean water is growing scarce food production is wasteful resources are less sustainable not a single one of us can escape climate change. Not a single one of us can fix it. But working together, our ideas get bolder. Our solutions are stronger. Our impact is bigger. This is the Call for Code Global Challenge. Join a community of 400,000 developers and innovators. Build your skills on open source technology and fight the effects of climate change. You could win $200,000 and have your solution deployed to communities in need by IBM, the Linux Foundation, and a global network of partners. There's only one planet Earth, but countless ways to help save it. Together, we can answer the call. Thank oh, you so much. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I, I have two questions to the both of you. So first of all, maybe you can talk a bit about um, uh, about the process, like how, how someone can, can join. How, how does it look like when you join that? And maybe you can give some insights into some, some current projects or, or basically what, what, uh, what's uh, maybe a bit of a deeper explanation for the topics. I heard water pollution. I heard hunger. Um, so what's, uh, what else is there? Sure. So I think what's important to mention is this this challenge. It's part of the Call for Code program, which is always running. And the global challenge is a bit like a hackathon. But um, maybe for those of you who are out there who are starting your developer journey, this is also a great way to get involved. It's not just for developers. If you're a problem solver, innovator, if you've got some ideas, this is also for you. So it's, it's not exclusively for developers. Um, but of course, it's using technology for good. And another way why it's a little different to a hackathon is at the end, the winning solutions are actually implemented. So as Sebastian said, we're in the fourth year of this global challenge and this program called for code. And each year we've had winners in all sorts of different places across the globe and their solutions have actually been implemented and are making a difference to people's lives in all sorts of areas. The first year was in Puerto Rico and I think last year was in Barcelona combating wildfires. So there's amazing change happening from this initiative and it's great to be a part of it. Um, and, and to your question, so yes, we're open to all sorts of people getting involved, not just developers. We also have a specific challenge just for students and the the prize, uh, you saw it in the video, Sebastian already mentioned it. Um, so yeah, the challenge is to use our tech to make a difference, to answer the big problems that are facing our world. And yeah, this year we're fighting climate change. So it's, it's a big topic for all of us and it's particularly on IBM's mind. So 
this is, yeah, climate change and the three categories, zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, and responsible production and green consumption. So if you've got an idea, you can go to the Corfu Code website on developer.ibm.com slash Corfu Code. Ah, you can see it on the screen. And yeah, you can check it out. We have lots of resources available. We want you to make the most of our technology. You can register here. You've got plenty of time till the end of July is when the global challenge runs. So yeah, we're looking forward to seeing your ideas and what change we can make together with technology. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. I think it's really an awesome project and, and, and really awesome that um, you together and also at, at IBM do that. Um, so it's worth giving it a look. Um, maybe uh, Miriam, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, have a nice rest of the day. Just started, right? And uh, hope to see you soon again. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Miriam. See, you know, okay. and maybe just to re-emphasize one thing that, that's really uh, that's really important to, to, to myself. Um, you know, the teams that are that can that can join this 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 challenge, uh, it, it's really really totally diverse. I mean, you don't need to be a developer, as Miriam said. Um, so if you just have an idea, you know, just the idea for a solution to fight one of these uh, three uh, categories: zero hunger, clean water, and sanitation, responsible for the production and green consumption. So just if you have the idea, you can start and and uh, create a team or join a team. So you don't need to be you know the the coding expert, right? You can you can just bring the idea, and then the teams gonna you know gonna gonna join your idea maybe if it's good you know you're gonna develop forward um and um also um the the timeline i mean it's plenty of time we started we started just we just just a couple of couple a few weeks ago and it runs until july uh, so it's basically two months time now to to go in to join the, the challenge and have to change have the chance really to make an impact to the world i mean it's not it's not even it's not bogus or so i mean what you develop here is really saving lives and and that's really i mean that's totally serious it's a, it's good tech really and um that's why we are all supporting this so 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 large okay good um then actually uh, another thing before we start with we have one interesting topic that i'm very much looking forward to it that's that we go to the ibm watson center yeah. but before that and still talking about code what i got here is actually i don't know if you can see it it's a it's a it's a mm -hmm. ticket for the uh, IBM Think, which is a very large conference. I think most people know it. And I saw there is a special code track, code at Think, um, specially designed for, for developers. Maybe just two or three sentences to that, and then let's really jump in, in into the Watson Center. Sure. Um, the code I think, or the, the thing itself, is is IBM uh, IBM's largest largest event worldwide, um, and uh, so it's you know IBMers are there, partners, customers, everybody's there. Uh, it, it's for free, and the code I think is a special track for developers. Um, tonight, tonight we start with the Americas version, and tomorrow we have the um, the European or the EMEA version. You see it here, um, where we have um, more than 200 training sessions, and you're gonna have the the most, the most, uh, I would say, the most broad spectrum of, of IBMers and partners and customers there, sh showing, explaining us what they did with technology, how they use the technology. Um, you, you have the chance really to learn how to apply and use our technology, and um, it's it's for free, 200 plus sessions, and you can get certifications which are industry recognized if you attend these sessions. So, uh, and and one more thing maybe before we uh, um, we, we continue here is that we have uh, a, a special um, a special giveaway. A goodie we are we are offering uh, as part of the challenge here at coded think um, there are nine electronic guitars they, they look really awesome I mean I just saw them yesterday across social media going wild so uh, nine e guitars be being being given away to uh, to, to the to the winners of a specific coded thing salad challenge so look into this um, as well Okay, that sounds very nice. Uh, I can only advise people to have a look and 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 see what's uh, what's in there at this conference. I will be joining. Interesting, interested in in, in what we are going to see. Um, yeah, hope that the guitars will also um, <laughs> get a get a get a good winner who is able to play on it. Um, let's let's get back to to one of our last sessions and and. Uh, I find this very cool because it's about self-driving cars. You know, the whole world is, is, is talking about it. And I actually didn't know that, that you at IBM are also working on self-driving cars because you only hear you know about the other brands. 
Um, and uh, also IBM Watson, uh, it's connected obviously these two topics. Um, many people or most of the people have heard about IBM Watson. They have a rough um, idea of what it is, what it does. Um, but not that many people know that actually there is really some cool stuff out there running on it. And uh, yeah, maybe we can, uh, I think we have prepared a session with uh, Francis who will show us something. Right. Um, so maybe let's basically jump in directly into the demo. Sounds good. Hello, Francis. Are you there? I am here. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Francis. Hi, good Francis. You. Good morning. Francis, you are in Munich, right? Yeah, I'm in Munich. Um, I'm here at the IBM Watson Center at Munich. Um, I'm currently on floor 22, and we have an amazing view of the Alps today. So I have the privilege of not only getting to present to you guys, but also having this amazing view behind me while I do it. So this is a, this is a real treat. Okay, I'm, I'm sure people want to see it. So let's jump in directly into what you're going to show us. Definitely. So um, what I'm going to show you guys today, and for this, I actually have to prepare three different inputs. So I'm quickly going to share my screen on uh, my uh, demo PC. And I'm also going to turn my video on my phone as well. So let's see if this will work. So hopefully you see uh, not my face, but you see some track. So here we are. Um, what we see here is a uh, track. And at the bottom here, we have a car. And so what is this exactly? Well, this is what we call trajectory optimization. And what we're going to do is I'm going to actually drive this car around the track. And we're going to show you how through the power of reinforcement learning, which is a type of machine learning which doesn't require explicit training, um, uh, to, to our specific supervised learning even. Um, so it doesn't really require human input to train. I'm going to show you how we can actually get this car around the track in record time. So a quick note about this. How does, uh, how does this compare to normal self-driving cars? Well, if we think about a Tesla, and we think about how a Tesla works if you put the autopilot on, and there are cameras in that car that actually use object detection to see uh, what's in front of it. Someone actually had to explicitly label hundreds if not thousands of images to say exactly uh, what things were. And this takes time and this takes human input. With our track here, we don't have to do that. We just tell the car to uh, go around in the fastest time possible and make it happen. So what I'm going to do first, um, you can see on the screen here, uh, if you look down at the bottom, you'll see there is actually a picture of the track. This corresponds directly to what you see in front of you. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to drive this round. So now hopefully you can see the car moving around the track. I'll drive it a little bit faster. And hopefully you can also see I'm getting some lap times in here. Seems like the first lap time was a little bit long, so I got a total time of 113 seconds, which is probably because I actually started the lap before I connected. But you can see from lap two and lap three, I took a little bit of time there, eight seconds and six seconds apparently. So the question is, now that I've driven around the track and I've not done the best job, what happens if we put Watson on this? Let's say if we train Watson and say, OK, Train yourself on 15 laps around this track. Let's see what happens. So here, now you can see the car's going, but it's sort of moving around a little bit, right? And if you look at the uh, pattern or the map um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it's not always taking the same pathway. This means that we're really still in the learning phase. It's not exactly sure uh, exactly what the right path to take is at this point. And that's precisely because we haven't trained it on enough laps yet. So this is an example of uh, an adequate reinforcement learning. But of course, the beautiful thing is um, we can train it on 150 laps instead. So when I do this and I click Run, now hopefully we should observe something a little bit different. Now, you can see that the trajectories or the lines at the bottom of the screen are much more green. This tells us that the car is going a lot faster than it was before. And in addition, now you can see it really has discovered 
an optimum trajectory to take. And the best part, if you look, you can see particularly uh, on our 150 lap drive, you can see we really have started to get those times down. And this is an example of how reinforcement learning uh, through a very quick training session, we've actually managed to optimize this very quickly. And again, without explicitly telling the car what to do, we set the goal and the car has to find it. So we really actually did implement this. This demo here is actually just a small representation of uh, what IBM actually did. We actually worked with an automotive manufacturer to create a self-driving car, and we have driven it uh, around the track in Hungary. And in fact, one of our data scientists who worked on this actually was sitting in the back of the car while no one was in the front. And he watched as the steering wheel turned itself, and he said it was quite an experience. So that's a little introduction to uh, some of the stuff we've been doing at IBM. Um, I hope this was interesting for you. And I would like to now hand it back to Sebastian. That's so awesome. Francis, thank okay. you so much. Amazing. I love it. You know, what, what I want, I'm, I'm, I'm not in AI so much, you know, so I wonder, you know, why and how? I mean, you know, can you explain maybe a little bit more details for the ones that have no clue about data and AI? How, how does it work? So um, there's various different types of artificial intelligence. Here, we're specifically talking about reinforcement learning. So this is, as I mentioned, this is a type of unsupervised learning. In this case, what we essentially do at a high level is we set a goal. Um, when we train uh, the model, what we do is we say the goal is to reduce the time taken to get around the track as much as possible. And in the beginning, uh, the car will have to simulate random movements, you know, left, right, go fast, go slow. Um, and through a case of trial and error, it will discover which sets of movements actually help achieve the goal of reducing the time taken to get around the track. So for example, if the car is going slowly, it might not get the same reward from the training um, where it would actually get a penalty versus if it went faster, it would get a reward. And so that is, that is in essence what we're doing here uh, with this reinforcement learning. I see, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, you know, that's, I guess that's part of all, all, all neural networks, right? I mean, having this, this reward system uh, in place, right? Okay, got it, yeah, thank you. Cool, cool thank stuff. You. Wow, that's, that's really cool. It's like Lewis Hamilton driving around, right? Or Max <laughs> Verstappen, however you like it. Um, yeah, I, I find it interesting that actually a couple of minutes before we started the event, when we joined in our, our Zoom sessions and so on, we just realized that Niklas, basically the developer advocate that uh, we met a couple of minutes ago, uh, has written some, some, some code for it a couple of years ago as well. So that's also a yeah, very, very nice story here. Right, right. And, you know, and maybe just to say a little bit about the Watson centers. I mean, you know, we have these Watson centers, I would say they're centers of, of innovation, of, of invention, um, and also our, our labs uh, spread around the globe, right? So, and there is really where, I, I, where, where sort of all the magic happens. And, you know, there, there's so much, so much development going on that um, I would also say in, in this new fresh IBM uh, that, that uh, the people don't know, right? I mean, you see that, that when we are here together and, and explaining what we do, and when we talk about open source, and develop advocacy and, and self-driving cars and things like that. And um, later we don't want to talk to, to the, look into the other things like the weather, weather data that Julia presents and also then quantum later and other things. I mean, you know, IBM is, is, is set around for more than 100 years. And, you know, it, it really reinvented, we are re reinventing ourselves basically every day, every week. Uh, yeah, changes in our DNA, I would say. Yeah, I mean... Uh, to be honest, like let's let's let, let's speak it out. So many people mm -hmm. are thinking IBM is still a dinosaur, right? Um, yeah. Looking into some stuff that you are, you are doing, I can basically just say no. It's it's definitely not. Um, so it's, it's 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 super cool projects, and I would I would just say uh, let's let's get another uh, ex, uh, example of IBM Watson, for example, this vending machine. It's basically um, sounds very simple. Uh, and someone wouldn't wouldn't say that uh, Watson uh, Watson service is behind that, but it's very cool. So maybe we can get a look into that too and win something. 
Yeah, d definitely. Um, the you know the the vending machine is something that that we brought up um, a, a few quarters or so ago last year. We started it basically. The vending machine, you know, was was born out of the idea that we are in this in this home office situation and we cannot really go to the conferences like in the past at the moment. Yeah, so hybrid events take place, but most of them really online. And we thought, well, why don't we bring some 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 giveaways, some swag, you know, so some goodies uh, to the people who attend these these online conferences. That's why we have the vending machine. It's it's at the moment it's virtual, so you can open it in the browser, and you go to a certain web page, and then you're gonna get the sort of the details how you can win or how you can get the code that you need for the vending machine. And it's like like you know it's like a soft drinks or like a snacks machine where you would you know sort of enter a coin and you you, you put the coin in the machine, and then the machine gets you a gets you a, sna a snack or a soft drink. This now gets you t-shirts and socks. Uh, in super colorful flavors, and and to get the code that you have to enter here, you need to deploy a chatbot. So it's really a, a, a low-code thing. It takes you like five to ten minutes, maybe. And also, you learn how to deploy your first own chatbot. Uh, if you did it, then you have even you even faster, maybe. Yeah. So you go to the IBM public cloud. You deploy the chatbot. You get a code. You enter the code here, and then it send you, um, you know, sort of these maybe socks with this little bee. Um, or uh, there are two t-shirts. I mean, I got the blue ones here, but of course you get others as well. Little ba ba ba. So you get even other colors, um, and I, I like them. I mean, you know, it sort of it also so shows our new, our new fresh approach. I hope with you know with this new nice logo, um, and um, we have already got some uh, um, amazing compliments for for the vending machine. People use it a lot, um, so I can just ask you go there, try it out. It's it's really easy. Yeah, I have a couple of spare minutes in the in the uh, afternoon, so I will try to get some of these socks. Um, yeah, um, we are slowly coming to an end. We are a bit over time already, but what would be a morning show without talking about the weather? So let's also talk about the weather a bit. So what have you prepared here? Um, we got Julia from the weather company or explaining us more what the weather company brought, brings to the table uh, when it comes to data and how weather data is used nowadays. Uh, and of course, weather data, data is a piece important piece of IoT of, of, of other, you know, for, for, for agriculture, you know, when, when really do the farmers have to, uh, can, can consider rain is coming, uh, about water pollution, about the, all these things that are really impacting our people's lives. So weather is everywhere. Um, all the time. And uh, by saying this, why don't we get over to Julia and getting us the details? Yes, Hi. let's welcome Julia. Hi. Yes, Hi. thank you for having me. Well, honestly, the first thing uh, that came to mind to me today was when Francis was uh, presenting the self-driving cars. That's something we're working with because what's really important uh, for self-driving cars and safety uh, issues is what is the road uh, surface friction. And that friction very much depends on the weather but also what kind of concrete it is and yeah, you know, but that kind of concrete, that is something that's very static. <laughs> the weather is not. <laughs> so um, we use a lot of different variables here, you know, uh, ponding, um, uh, fog, um, ice, uh, snow, and uh, we work with uh, automotive companies that implement this kind of data into uh, the um, models they're building for these cars. So it's not just, you know, where do you need to steer, but also should you slow down because there is a chance of aqua planning. And yeah, uh, as Sebastian just said, I work with plenty of companies globally that uh, do smart irrigation with weather data that don't just look at weather data, but also geospatial data. What is soil moisture looking like? Do we actually need to irrigate even if it's not raining? Um, in order to, you know, optimize water consumption because we know that in agriculture water consumption is an issue and uh, there are a lot of iot technologies that are helping us uh, to optimize this better today in order to save water as well and what i've prepared and uh, said i think you'll have to start that 
yeah, is a small video and you mentioned earlier that weather is really nice where you are. We prepared something um, going from Munich to Vienna because I have bad news for you. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, uh, now if you start this video, uh, honestly this week weather in Central Europe very interesting. Uh, basically, all of the Alps are currently seeing um, uh, storms. It is windy in Munich. And as you can see here, Munich today is reaching a little bit over 20 degrees. You know that in Vienna, it's a lot warmer. I'm further west and I'm only at 15 degrees right now. And what we'll have uh, today and then the coming days, importantly, Munich, as well as Eastern Germany, there will be a lot of uh, rainfall we have uh, the tendency for flooding for the coming days and specifically you know with that holiday we're going into Thursday it will be wet sorry mm. about that <laughs> okay. couldn't you change this <laughs> <laughs> well that is an interesting one and you know, the weather for Munich here for the next uh, few days, you can see it's going to be a little colder even than it was today and what we've seen over the weekend. And um, when we take a look at Vienna, it's a little bit warmer, but still rainy for the coming days. And that's something, you know, in um, weather, atmospheric science, uh, there are a couple of things that have traditionally been done to change the weather, which basically only is uh, infusing clouds with um, uh, silver iodine, and um, so they will rain somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something with this kind of weather that's kind of tough, and it's also ecologically not the best idea to do. <laughs> So we'll stick to using the weather data and IoT to uh, improve our lives and not just our lives. Um, and the video you've just seen, I mean, I've talked about agriculture, cars. Um, that video rendering is something that was developed within the weather company and that we use for all kinds of use cases within broadcasting media today. So yeah, a lot of different use cases. Sebastian. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, and uh, Seat, um, just one sentence. I mean, you know, whether or data, um, data or AI infused processes, this is something we are working on at IBM very, uh, very intense, you know, because we think AI should be infused in any process everywhere. And this is where we're working on investing a lot of time at the moment. Yes, that's, that sounds very cool. Also very nice video. like just the video as it is, not just the AI behind. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, Sebastian, if you and I, if we would be an AI, we would definitely make it in time, but we didn't make it, but True. it doesn't matter. I think it was very, <laughs> very, very intensive and very interesting. So we talked about developer advocacy. We talked about um, MVPs. We talked about uh, responsible computing, uh, tech for good. We saw a self-driving uh, self car demo with uh, IBM Watson. We talked about the vending machine, IBM Think, the conference uh, with a track for developers code at Think. We talked about the weather. Um, I don't know if I missed something, if you want to add uh, something or wrap it a bit up before we go in a very short break and start with the next session. Sure. Uh, first, let me say thank you, Seat and team. You know, it was, was really fun to be here in, in these early morning hours. Um, you know, uh, one thing more maybe to emphasize is really about the learning journeys, the training sessions that we do. Um, you know, so we have always have learning, learning series, uh, learning journeys out there that it's free, it's public, it's on Meetup, it's on Crowdcast, you know, and it's focusing on, on all topics like data and AI, hybrid cloud, IoT, blockchain, whatever you might need uh, skills wise, it's out there. We do it um, and you can, we, you know, it, it's, it's said it's free. Um, we do it because our mission is really to, to equip developers with the right skills and technology. Um, and uh, I guess that's the important piece uh, that I would like to add at this moment. Okay. Also from my side, Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us and helping me navigate to, uh, through that day. Um, that's, that, that's very nice. And I hope that I can visit you very soon in a physical version in, in at your at your yeah That'd offices in, in Germany. Yeah. First of all I have to visit Francis and play a bit around with the I call it Carrera Ban, you know it's like that, that, that what you did as a child. Um, and uh, yeah looking forward to that one. So um, 
Yeah, we are going into a next session actually. We make maybe a break. So what is backstage? What are you saying? Let's do a two minute break maybe? Yes. Yeah, okay. We are doing a two minute break and then we are going into a topic which is also very interesting, quantum computing. And in this case, hands on. So see you in two minutes again. Thank you. Bye. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm here with Jan. Jan, hello. I see you. Hi, where are you joining us from? Actually, I'm in Karlsruhe, in the southwest of Germany. The weather is not so nice over here. Ah, okay. Yeah, we saw it in the weather forecast. It will be even more wet. So, yeah, right. what should you do? Um, but let's talk about a very interesting topic. So, you're a quantum computing expert. And um, as people saw from the title, we're going through a hands-on journey. Uh, through quantum computing topics, maybe can can you give a bit of a um, details up front? What what can people expect from this session? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we call it hands-on journey to quantum computing with IBM, and uh, I think that fits very well that future of tech day. And uh, I will give a short introduction to quantum computing first. Uh, when was the idea born? What was the purpose? Uh, briefly speaking about the IBM development roadmap. So that is not so much about the hardware development, but really a lot of consequences for software development. Uh, and then the fun part begins. Uh, so I will give a demo. Yeah, what can be done hands on? And everything that I show will be available to everybody here to do that afterwards in your own time. 
Um, and then at the end, we will have a look at, uh, so what can you do with quantum computing at home? Uh, be uh, surprised uh, what, what we will see there. I mean, uh, uh, obviously you cannot build a real quantum computer at home, uh, but you can do interesting things at home. We will see that at the end of this. Okay, episode. looking forward to that one. Okay, so Jan, I will not take more of your time. The stage is yours. Right, so uh, let's start and go back uh, 40 years in time. Uh, 40 years ago, there was a conference organized by the MIT and IBM. It was called the Physics of Computation Conference, where Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, uh, discussed an observation and, and then an idea. His observation was that if you want to try to simulate quantum mechanical systems, uh, on a traditional computer, on a digital computer, uh, even for quite small systems with only a few quantum, let's say, particles, uh, that uh, requires a tremendous computational power and especially memory. Uh, so that uh, it is very hard to simulate quantum mechanical systems on digital, on classical computers. And uh, we see that on the following chart, um, an illustration. So we call these uh, yeah, quantum particles, let's call them uh, qubits. And you can see that even for a small number of qubits, if you look at the amount of memory that is required to describe the status of these quantum mechanical systems, uh, that it starts small, obviously, uh, but then with each additional qubit, with each additional like particle, uh, the requirement in memory doubles. Yeah? And pretty soon uh, it becomes really, really large. And you can see that even for a moderate number of uh, like 160, um, quantum uh, uh, objects that, that are uh, uh, in, in that system, uh, we would require a traditional computer that has more bits than there are atoms on planet Earth, which is clearly impossible to do. Uh, so this shows uh, that there's a large uh, kind of overhead. Yeah, If you want to uh, simulate quantum mechanics with traditional digital computers. And then the idea of Richard Feynman was what if we had a different kind of computers that are based on these qubits instead of digital bits and make these uh, qubits directly like accessible and controllable. And uh, that would be a breakthrough at least for simulating these uh, quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical systems. Okay, so I think uh, we, we understand that idea. And uh, then the question was, would it also be possible to use this kind of power and in a positive sense, complexity of a quantum computer based on these qubits, uh, also for other uh, purposes, for other algorithms, for other use cases. And, uh, and let's have a look at two examples. So one, sorry, um, one example is here, uh, very uh, a simple task, yeah, just multiplication of two numbers, of two integer numbers. Uh, P times Q, yeah, we want to um, calculate the, the product. Uh, both are 2,000-bit uh, numbers uh, on a traditional computer. Sorry, that was uh, one page too far. This is the right page. Um, so on a traditional computer, that only takes a couple of milliseconds. Yeah, that's what, what computers are made for, what they do day in and day out. Um, and on a quantum computer, yeah, there's an estimate, even if that quantum computer would be big enough, yeah, bigger than the quantum computers are today, uh, it would still take 75 seconds on a quantum computer. So that is not good news. Yeah, I mean, this uh, would, would uh, make you believe, okay, quantum computers uh, take much longer, at least for these computations, than traditional computers. But now let's have a look at a very similar um, problem, the factorization of integer numbers. Yeah, so if we have a large number, n, 2,000-bit uh, number, and want to calculate the prime factors uh, of that number, and probably you are aware that uh, this is a, a key part of the encryption on the internet uh, of the RSA um, algorithm, for example. And on uh, traditional uh, computers, uh, this factorization would take a couple of billion CPU years. Yeah, you can have a cluster and it's only a, maybe a couple of million years, uh, but it takes very long. And that is uh, the, the basic idea 
yeah, why we consider these kind of encryption as secure. And then around uh, 15 years ago, uh, Peter Shaw has uh, developed or uh, found an algorithm, Shaw's algorithm, which can do, once quantum computers are large enough, such a factorization in eight hours. Yeah, and you can see that clearly see that this is a, a breakthrough and this really illustrates the power and the exponential speed up of quantum computers compared to traditional computers. But as we have seen with the uh, problem before, the yeah, multiplication of, of numbers, uh, quantum computers are only or are, have this exponential power only for very specific uh, tasks and very specific algorithms and use cases. Okay, so um, let's have a look at, uh, 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 at a web search, yeah? And uh, in Google, there is this type ahead feature. And uh, uh, if you type uh, quantum computers will, then uh, it suggests uh, how could this uh, question go on? And the first uh, two suggestions are quantum computers will never work or change everything. And uh, I mean, that re directly relates to what we have just seen. Yeah? For some tasks like factorization, uh, it's a breakthrough. And for other tasks, it provides no advantage uh, over classical computing. Okay, let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. So for what uh, problems, for what uh, tasks are quantum computers uh, or are they expected uh, to, to provide really a, a more power than traditional computers? And as we can see here, these are different like problem classes. Yeah, the white in the middle are problems that can be calculated uh, very uh, well or easily on traditional computers. Uh, then, as we have seen, um, the simulating of quantum mechanics, that is something outside the capability, at least for a bit, a bit larger uh, systems, uh, outside the capability of traditional computers. Uh, the factoring, yeah, that takes very long on traditional computers, but works very well on quantum computers. And other application areas are chemistry, yeah, material science, which is very close to the original idea of Feynman, simulating quantum mechanical systems, but also for machine learning optimization. Quantum computers or algorithms are known that run on quantum computers that provide an advantage over classical computing. So now let's have a look um, at uh, what that means for, for developer and for the developer ecosystem. Uh, actually, we, three, we see uh, three kinds of uh, developers uh, that are relevant in this uh, quantum uh, area. Uh, first, let's uh, look from right to left. Uh, we have the kernel developers. Uh, that is not an operating system kernel, what, what we mean here. Uh, but these are developers who work uh, very close uh, to the quantum hardware. Um, and later, we will see the operations that can be done on these quantum bits. These are called quantum gates. Yeah, they are similar to traditional logic operations like AND, OR, and NOT, and so on. Um, and uh, the kernel developers uh, kind of de design their own gates, their own operations, uh, and optimize that on that specific quantum hardware. Uh, and for that, they use something called pulse level access. Um, the qubits on our systems, they are controlled with microwave pulses. Uh, and it is possible to design your own optimized pulses. Yeah. So that's what the kernel developers do. Then we have the algorithm developers. They develop and implement uh, algorithms like the Shaw algorithms, but uh, probably uh, others uh, which are more relevant for, for other use cases uh, and develop uh, like building blocks yeah, on, on that level of algorithms or, or parts of algorithms. Then we have the model developers. Um, who kind of uh, package uh, the algorithms in a form that they are then easily usable and accessible to application developers, yeah, to uh, industry experts who really want to solve a practical, a relevant problem. And now on the next chart, uh, we see the idea, we call that frictionless development, which shows that um, the uh, classical developers, yeah, so the application developers who implement use cases, they have a certain environment, a language that they use and, uh, and so on, and that should not change. Yeah? So we want to make the quantum algorithms and the quantum computers uh, be available or become available in a form 
that uh, the application developers can they use can use their existing environment, the existing languages, uh, the existing libraries, and then the code just gets executed on a quantum computer, maybe a bit similar to what we see nowadays with graphics units. So some code in machine learning gets executed on a GPU instead of a CPU. And maybe in future, we will have something like a QPU, a quantum processing unit, which accelerates specific algorithms or parts of algorithms. Now bringing uh, that together, uh, let's have a look at the uh, development roadmap. Um, there's a lot to say about this. I, I will only touch uh, some of these aspects. On the lower side, on the lower hand, uh, you see the uh, hardware development. Currently, we have a system with 65 qubits, 65 such uh, quantum bits. Later this year, we will go to 127 qubits. Uh, and in two years, in 23, to more than 1,000 qubits. Now, the pure number of qubits uh, is not uh, everything that counts. Yeah? It is important, but also the quality of the qubits, uh, which is influenced by noise and, and other errors, uh, is very important and uh, is a, a key to really uh, leveraging the real potential of quantum computers. Yeah? So that is not indicated here in the chart, but, but very important. And then uh, in the layers above that, we see these uh, different uh, kinds of developers. Uh, and for example, later this year, we will, delete, we will release something called Qiskit Runtime, which is a much closer integration between the quantum part and the classical control. And actually, we expect a speed up of 100 times uh, for the execution of quantum circuits. So these are quantum algorithms or quantum code uh, compared to, to what we have today. Uh, and then next year, uh, we see the dynamic circuits uh, that will increase uh, or improve the kind of algorithmic complexity, yeah, the kinds of algorithms that can be implemented on the quantum hardware. And uh, actually today in such a quantum circuit, there is no branching. Yeah? There's no if then else within a single quantum circuit. And uh, that will be uh, uh, become available or possible as part of these dynamic circuits next year. Okay, so I think uh, that's it uh, about the roadmap. Now, the fun part and the exciting part, uh, hands on. As mentioned, uh, I will make a demo. I, I will show uh, all the things and everything of this is available to, to you to do that at your own pace afterwards. Uh, and I will also show you where you find that. And that includes access to the real quantum computers and also to simulators, but specifically to real quantum computers on the IBM cloud. Okay, so let's uh, open a web browser. And uh, actually we start uh, with the page of, of this talk. And uh, now if you do a web search with the title of this talk, so hands-on journey to quantum computing with IBM, then you will find uh, obviously uh, this session here, uh, but also an article on Medium, on medium.com, which has the same title, Hands-on Journey to Quantum Computing with IBM. And uh, that actually uh, lists uh, the things that, that we will uh, do now, or that I will demo now. So actually this is uh, kind of the handout and includes all of the uh, uh, URLs uh, that uh, you can uh, dive into later. Okay, so first thing that is described here, is a quantum coin game. Um, actually, that works with a single qubit, yeah? so only one uh, of these qubits, and it illustrates two fundamental concepts of quantum computing, which are called superposition and interference. Maybe you have heard about a superposition. Uh, some people describe it like a quantum object can be in two states at the same time, which is not really correct. Uh, but uh, a line, so a quantum object can be in a superposition. Yeah? So in a linear combination of two states uh, or of two basis states. Um, and uh, what that means and how that can be used to win a certain game, yeah, this quantum coin game, uh, that is illustrated here in, in, in uh, this demo. Actually, that is part uh, of a GitHub repository, which is called Fun with Quantum. And so let's have a look at that one. So it's a GitHub repo uh, to illustrate the power and beauty of quantum computing. It includes introductory examples, yeah, that illustrate, for example, with this coin game, 
superposition and interference. And uh, the code can be executed in Binder. Yeah, probably you know that it's an online service that provides uh, the, the possibility to execute um, uh, Python notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, uh, free of charge. Uh, and in that environment, then this uh, quantum coin game runs. It includes complete uh, instructions how to uh, use the like the interface and also a detailed uh, explanation of the formulas, so kind of the quantum mechanics uh, that describes then uh, what, what happens with this one qubit and the coin and how you can win the game with a, a quantum algorithm, which cannot be won reliably uh, with a classical algorithm. So that is the, the quantum coin game. Uh, then uh, let's move to number four here, the GHZ game. That is a bit more, let's say, a complex game that uses three qubits and then describes the uh, concept of entanglement in German Verschränkung. And uh, that is what uh, Einstein commented as a spooky action at the distance. Yeah, and to understand that uh, in, in a bit more detail, there's something called GHZ game which we also have implemented and which you can also access here uh, on, that, uh, on that GitHub repository. And again, without the need to install anything on your local system, yeah, it's completely backwards. Then the next demo, GHZ on real systems, on real quantum devices, uh, then describes what happens uh, if you do not run these uh, things on a simulator, which kind of works uh, perfectly and without errors and without noise, but instead on a real quantum computer, yeah, and it also shows how to access the real quantum computers. Uh, and then uh, what uh, uh, effects we see with these uh, uh, noise and so on, uh, and how these effects can be controlled and mitigated. Um, so then uh, going back to number two and three, these are two other examples dealing with Boolean satisfiability problems. And uh, they actually do not explain the, they do not try to explain the details of the algorithm and some quantum mechanical stuff like superposition entanglement and so on. But these show how kind of easy it is, it can be, it will be to use a quantum algorithm to solve a specific problem. In this case, the Boolean satisfiability problem, yeah, which is a standard uh, problem from, from uh, uh, computer science. Um, and so here we can see that after you have defined the problem, yeah, which is purely a, a classical task, yeah, uh, that then only a very few lines of code, yeah, less than 10 lines of code are needed to uh, call in quantum, like API, a quantum algorithm to solve that problem and, and get the result. Uh, so that goes a bit in the direction of this frictionless development, which we have mentioned earlier. Okay, so uh, that is the, the fun with quantum repository and you can spend some time uh, to, to explore that. Then going back uh, to this uh, article, yeah, uh, then it mentions a visualization of the Bloch sphere. The Bloch sphere is a, a mathematical, like model or mathematical representation of a single qubit. Yeah, a qubit is not really round like it or a sphere as it uh, looks here. Yeah, that is a mathematical model that, describe, that can describe the state yeah, and how you can change the state applying several of these quantum gates um, on, on, on that uh, single qubit. Actually, we will have a look at this uh, a bit later. So uh, then let's have a look at the IBM quantum experience. That is uh, one of the key websites from IBM around quantum computing. And uh, let's have a look uh, what we can do uh, there. So first of all, we can have a look at the, it is called quantum services. And actually these are the real quantum computers um, that exist on the cloud. Uh, those uh, with the uh, lock here are not accessible, uh, but the other ones uh, are accessible or many of them are accessible to use for you for free. And uh, now if we uh, uh, have a look uh, at uh, one of these systems, uh, we see some details uh, like, uh, so this is a five qubit system and uh, we can uh, also see very detailed data of these noise and error, yeah, which, uh, uh, which uh, of these uh, quantum computer gets uh, affected by. Uh, and we can see that uh, for these five qubits, yeah, they have this uh, kind of linear topology here um, that they do not have the same like quality and error rates. And in this case, uh, 
for example, if you have an algorithm that only leads three qubits, yeah, then you could use the qubits number zero, one, and two, but these have higher error rates than if you would use the qubits number two, three, and four. Yeah, so you could you can kind of manually select which qubits and select the best ones yeah, you want to use uh, for your algorithms and, and for your computations. Okay, so uh, next uh, thing uh, is the quantum composer. That is an, and let's start uh, a new file here. That is a graphical interface uh, that lets you create quantum circuits, so quant kind of quantum programs or, or quantum algorithms. And uh, if we start, um, so let's uh, remove uh, two of these qubits, so we only have a single qubit. Uh, and then we use this H gate, yeah, it's a Hadamard gate. Um, and actually, this creates this uh, superposition, yeah, is that, so that this uh, qubit is in a, in a linear combination of two of the basis states. And that is indicated here below that if we would do a measurement uh, of that uh, qubit, uh, then we would have a, a statistical probability. Yeah, of 50% to find that in state zero and 50% to find it in state one. Now, doing it a bit more complex and interesting, uh, we apply a, what is called a C not gate, uh, and this creates entanglement, yeah, for Schrenkung, uh, between these two qubits. Uh, and actually, that means uh, if we have, if we kind of look at or measure one of these two qubits, uh, then it is purely uh, probabilistic, yeah, if we find uh, the qubits in state zero or in state one. And that is true for each of the two qubits. Uh, but now if we look at both qubits, yeah, then we can be sure that both are always in the same state. Yeah, uh, both are either, or both are measured in the same state, both will be measured either, either both as zero or both at one. Okay, so that needs a bit more explanation about uh, the, the a theory of quantum computing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm aware that this is not fully transparent uh, with, with uh, this short explanation. And now I have added a third qubit, another gate here. And now we have created one of the famous uh, like uh, quantum states, which is called a GHZ state, which now has uh, three qubits who are then also all three measured uh, with the same result. Always. Okay, then we can add uh, measurements. Right, and then now it gets interesting. Really execute this circuit that we have just built first uh, uh, on a simulator. This also uh, down here, so the, the cousin simulator. We can use that one. Run it on the simulator, um, and uh, in a few seconds we will see the result. Or we, we can see the result. Now we can also do that on a real quantum computer. Now let's have a look here. Maybe this one, uh, the, the queue. So the uh, jobs that other people have submitted, there are only four here. Uh, so that is not too long. It, long. it will take a couple of minutes before we see the result. So let's uh, submit this job to the essence uh, system. And uh, then over here, we can see that on the simulator, uh, the job has already completed. And we can see the result as expected. Yeah. Uh, and then in a couple of minutes, uh, we could also see the result. Uh, it's running already. We can, oh, it's finished already. So that was really quick. I did not expect that. So now we can see the result uh, on the essence system. And you see that there's a slight difference to what we have seen before on that ideal simulator. So we see also here with a 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, that it has the highest probability. But there's also some noise effect so that we measure also some other uh, measurement results which is part of that noise that, that we have mentioned earlier. Okay, so that was the uh, uh, quantum composer, the graphical interface. And on the right-hand side, you can already see some code. And actually we can open what we have just created here uh, in a programming language or environment, which is called Qiskit. That is the IBM quantum computing um, uh, software framework. It's completely open source. And uh, now uh, this gets automatically like translated to Qiskit code uh, and um, another um, online environment which lets you run Jupyter Notebooks uh, is, uh, is opened and available for use. So we can execute that. 
with uh, shift enter. And uh, I will remove here two lines of code and also execute this. And then draw that circuit. And as expected, I mean, it looks similar to what we have designed before. And uh, now we just need a very few lines of code, but I will not type it. I will do a copy and paste um, to run this uh, on the simulator or on the real backend. Uh, in this case, we choose the simulator again. And then uh, we need a few more lines of code to really execute it and print the results. Yeah, so end up right. So this is the result already. And uh, we could also, instead of the simulator, choose a real backend, as we have seen before, the essence system or one of the others. And then after a couple of minutes, we really we see the result uh, of this program executing on a real device. Yeah. And obviously you can change it. Yeah. So over here you could change uh, the uh, like quantum gates and do your own experiments. And uh, I think that that is uh, really exciting uh, that uh, this can be done with such an innovative technology yeah, that uh, this is available for free yeah, for your experiments and, and your education. Right, so next option uh, here in the, uh, on this website, there's also a quantum lab, uh, which uh, directly opens uh, this uh, Jupyter Notebook interface uh, so that you can uh, uh, use and, and uh, the Qiskit code. And what I wanted to show here is uh, that in the documentation, there are tutorials. Uh, and uh, you should start with a, a Qiskit folder and then there's a start here, which is always good. Yeah. And uh, so that gives a good uh, navigation uh, for all of the tutorials uh, that are available here. So it has a, a basic circuits, advanced circuits, uh, then uh, various algorithms and, and so on. Everything is described here, which you can go, can go through. But then uh, the next uh, thing that I would like to show is uh, really the Qiskit website, qiskit.org. Uh, that is a kind of the homepage obviously of our quantum computing framework. And then in the learn section, you go there, uh, then we find a Qiskit textbook. And that is not a textbook to print and read. Uh, you, you can do that, but uh, it's uh, much more interesting uh, that uh, it is an online and interactive textbook. So it inter includes um, code snippets, which then can be executed on this online simulator or, or the real systems. And it uh, is a textbook that describes the fundamentals of quantum computing, uh, then the basic uh, uh, like uh, building blocks of algorithms, then real algorithms like the Shaw algorithm, which we have mentioned, but, but also others. Um, then we also see the code here, or we can see the code to measure the quantum volume, yeah, which is kind of a, a benchmark for the capacity and, and uh, capability of a quantum computer. Yeah, you can see here how that works and can execute that yourself. And then we have uh, other chapters uh, speaking about uh, how to do this uh, microwave uh, control and um, the effects that we see on real quantum hardware. Right, so that's it uh, about uh, what is described here in this uh, article, which I mentioned on medium.com. And all of the URLs that we have used uh, are included in that article. Good. So uh, next part and final part of the presentation that is now quantum computing at home. Yeah. And uh, um, what you can do at home is uh, build a little uh, quantum computer. So in, in the uh, chart, uh, on, uh, you see in the lower right hand side, that picture is actually a picture of the real IBM quantum computer, which is called IBM Q system one. And what I have in my hands here is a, obviously a, a model of that, a, three, a 3D printed model, which looks very similar uh, to that uh, real quantum computer, but it is not only a, a 3D printed model, it is a functional model. Now, what, what does that mean? And uh, actually inside of this model, uh, right here in the back, there's a Raspberry Pi included. 
And that is also the reason why we call that Rust Q berry. Yeah, it's a Raspberry Pi with some quantum. Yeah. Uh, and uh, on that Raspberry Pi, you can install Qiskit, that uh, IBM uh, quantum programming framework. And so you can run a, a quantum computing simulator on the Raspberry Pi that is included here in this model, uh, and also use that to access the real quantum computers on the cloud. And then we have a, a three, no, sorry, a four inch uh, touch display integrated uh, on the back that can be used uh, to uh, control the system and run uh, some of the quantum demos. And uh, now I will, uh, will show uh, two of these demos. And actually uh, I have a VNC, so a remote desktop connection uh, to that system that I have just shown. And uh, right, so maybe first let's have a look at the quantum composer yeah, that we have seen before. And uh, that also runs uh, on this uh, little uh, Raspberry. And I, uh, right. so maybe the important uh, thing to know is uh, that uh, the website, yeah, the uh, uh, circuit composer, that is a responsive website, but not really made for a four inch display. So we have to uh, clean up uh, that a little bit and uh, to remove uh, some of the, what is being displayed here. And we can collapse the gates, uh, right? And then you can we can use it in exactly the same way uh, as we have seen before yeah, on, 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 the, on the web. Then another demo that we have is the block sphere demo, which I skipped uh, earlier. And uh, so we can also go in full screen mode here. And that is uh, this uh, mathematical model of a quantum bit. Yeah. And so we can see it can be in state zero or in state one. And we can apply uh, these gates. Yeah. For example, uh, an X gate, which is uh, similar to a knot. Um, and uh, now this uh, moves it uh, to the one state, uh, back to zero, and we can apply a Hadamard gate and then uh, analyze that uh, from uh, all angles and, and from all sides. Okay, then uh, the last demo that uh, I would like to show is a demo that uses uh, some LEDs that are integrated into this model. And uh, so uh, let's start that. And this demo uses the, the simulator and it creates uh, a certain quantum state uh, with uh, superposition and entanglement. Uh, and uh, then the measurement results, the zeros and ones are now displayed yeah, with the LEDs, which are integrated here in the, the cryostat. Uh, and uh, zero uh, is like red and, and one is, is blue. And now we can see here that the result of, of these uh, experiments. Right. So basically that is uh, what I have prepared, what I wanted to show. Um, the installation uh, of that uh, Raspberry is uh, quite simple. Yeah? Um, so we are, there are only three commands necessary to install the boot strap script uh, that then uh, gives you a, a menu interface uh, so that you can install Kisskit and, and uh, all that stuff and the demos. So final page. Uh, two important URLs. Uh, one is the raspberry.org. That is the GitHub page for Raspberry, where you get all the information, also the STL files for the 3D printing uh, of that model, a bit of material, everything. Uh, and then the URL uh, for that uh, article, which we have uh, uh, looked at. And again, if you, if you just do a web search with the title, Hands on Journey to Quantum Computing with IBM, you will find that article on Medium. So, Thanks a lot for your, your attention. And I hope I have uh, shown some of the uh, excitement and what you can really do hands on with quantum computing today. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, that was really amazing. So um, yeah, I didn't know that basically you could do something from home as well. Uh, thanks also for sharing the resources. Um, maybe we can get into a split screen, just asking backstage. Just a second. Jan, for a completely beginner, like someone who is basically, you know, only touched at uh, quantum computing on the on the surface, what would you say is the best uh, way to get more deeper into the topic? Yeah. So actually, uh, uh, there are several meetup groups already existing or emerging. Yeah, and uh, some of them from time to time, again, offer a kind of introduction um, session to quantum computing. So that is a good start. 
Uh, I mean, nowadays, because everything is virtual, yeah, just uh, have a look at the meetup page yeah, and, and uh, uh, look for an appropriate meetup. From time to time, we do one around Raspberry and also a longer version of this hands-on session. Yeah, so that was really, really quick today. I, I understand that. Um, and then really the Kiske textbook. Yeah, that is really good uh, with all of the explanation, the, the basics, uh, and you can go through that in your own pace you know, to, to understand that. And maybe a recommendation would be uh, to form a small study group. Yeah, it always helps, helps if you have uh, a small group of people uh, with whom you can learn together and, and discuss this uh, sometimes really complicated uh, topics. Okay, and uh, another question also basically for, for uh, beginners. Maybe you can play a bit with your imagination and give us some examples of what developers could actually do as, as let's call it projects or some ideas, uh, something easy to get started with. Yes. So, uh, I mean, what, what I started last year with a small team was developing this Raspberry, and now we are developing new uh, quantum demos. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that would be one suggestion. Yeah, join the Raspberry project yeah, and add your own quantum computing demos uh, to that one. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, on that uh, Kiskit website and as part of the Kiskit textbook, there are many tutorials and examples available and you can use that and modify them uh, to run them your own, um, like uh, uh, small algorithms and, and for your own use cases. Yeah. So I think that this uh, that gives a lot of uh, inspiration yeah, for things that, that you can then, then do yourself and, and modify. Okay, so uh, Jan, thank you very much. We are a bit short on time, so if anyone uh, has additional questions, maybe you can uh, again reshare your um, contact data, email address, or whatever you're comfortable with, Twitter handle. Yes, um, so we can share that. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if I have that included here in the presentation, but if you do a web search and on LinkedIn, you, you will definitely find me and, and can connect with me. Yeah, that's. That's a good way always. Okay, Jan, thank you so much and hope to see you again soon. Uh, have a nice day. Uh, nice greetings to Karlsruhe. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. Okay. So we are going into the last session of today as we are short on time. Um, we will actually jump directly into it. We will talk about uh, or we'll see an interesting discussion about uh, hackathons and how they can help revolutionize our uh, society and our world. Very interesting discussion with uh, Bente Aking, uh, who is the founder of the Hero Loop, and also with uh, Stephanie, who is the developer relations lead at IBM. So let's have a look into that as well and uh, see you later for a short wrap up. My name is Stephanie Kleipel and besides leading the developer marketing and relations at IBM for Europe, Middle East and Africa, I'm also leading the Call for Code Challenge in Europe. And today I'm here with uh, Bente Aking, founder of uh, the Hero Loop and winner of the first regional Call for Code award in Europe. Before we start, um, have you heard about the Call for Code Challenge? Uh, maybe it's good if I start with explaining you a little bit more about this hackathon. So it's a global challenge. It's created by the David Clark cause and uh, joining forces with, for example, the Linux Foundation, um, the United Nations Human Rights Office. Um, and IBM, as one of the founding partners, opens up its uh, tools and software to 24 million developers around the world. And this yearly challenge is uh, focused about uh, building solutions to fight back about the most uh, pressing issues of our time. So it won't be a surprise to you that the challenge for uh, 2020 was focused around the COVID-19 pandemic. So looking at remote learning, crisis communication and community building. And of course, we um, recognize that uh, no one can solve these world problems all alone and some solutions may be more suitable for specific regions. And given the overwhelming number of submissions from Europe, we've decided to launch a regional competition in addition to the global program. And before I start my chat with, uh, with Benta, um, there's one more thing I wanted to tell you about this hackathon because it's actually not just an ordinary hackathon. What's really nice about it is that there's a strong focus on support for the top solutions 
to be open sourced and deployed. So that means that um, we will support the winning teams in their next steps to deployment, but also ask other developers to jump in on the open source projects. And that's why I'm today here uh, with Benta. Benta and I will be talking a bit more about uh, her solution. Um, she will tell a bit about her challenges that she had along the way. And of course, she will give you some tips on how to start bringing your own ideas to life. But before we talk about these steps from ID to deployment, Benta, welcome. And congratulations again on winning the 2020 Cover Code Challenge in Europe. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Hero Loop and what it's about. Um, yeah. Great. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the Hero Loop yeah. is a social platform that brings people together. It's a COVID nineteen response, a web app. Um, it's built with open source uh, uh, on uh, Red Hat OpenShift. Um, so it's a web app that matches people, uh, people available uh, to help are called uh, heroes and people that need help uh, are called loopers. So uh, the loopers keep the loop going and that's why we call it the hero loop. Uh, so the matching is done um, in the community where you live uh, with the people that uh, have the same interests as you. Um, so it's local, but it's uh, possible to scale it worldwide. And our mission is to reduce loneliness worldwide and to help our world uh, rise back from COVID-19. So uh, we also strive to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, and we support, support many of the goals, uh, many of the 17 goals. So we built the Hero Loop with blockchain and with anonymous login to protect uh, people's privacy data. Uh, it's encrypted with a public key. Um, we strive to keep the highest uh, GDPR protocols and we use, for example, regex to keep users from entering uh, privacy data within the tool. We use AI for removing toxic messages. So you cannot uh, enter a message with some language that is toxic. It's stopped and you need to re-enter the message with something better language uh, and also we use AI exactly. to match people yeah so that uh, the matching is on the location and also with the interest of people the people yes yeah, so they yeah. share yeah wow yeah so it's, yeah it's really well well thought about uh, about all the, the the different parts of of the hero loop um so I'm also curious how did you come with this idea because Venta you are are the founder so you must have had one moment when you thought this is what we should should do or how did it go yeah so in march um you know we were all in despair we we saw covid 19 spread across the world uh, we saw you know people had to stay inside we had to wash our hands um so i started to think because um you know, all the streets were empty everywhere on the news. Uh, the Italians sang from their balconies. Uh, so there was a lockdown and it really like people were dying. It just, too, it's too much. Like we need to, I felt I have to do something uh, than just listen to the news. So I was talking to my friend, good friend Madumita and uh, we thought about like, ah, there's a Thai restaurant nearby and they can't sell anything. They have to throw their food away. Uh, so what about the people that, you know, can't go outside? Can't we match them somehow? Oh, uh, you know, these risk, risk groups. And so we started, you know, that's where it started. And we started like, yeah, thinking of how can we help? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so, so I didn't want you, to like, you just, have this you know, idea. Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, here. Oh, sorry. I didn't uh i thought of something more <laughs> I, so yeah, I didn't like this, <laughs> i didn't want to just sit and not do anything like i said um but i like um i wanted to bring myself out there because i have like 20 years of skills and experience from it like global it and so why don't i you know you know try to put this to use somehow 
like that will help every everyone. And I didn't want it to just be where I lived. I wanted to be for the whole world. So I was like, okay, that's how I decided to. I decided oh, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> Yeah, a very ambitious plan, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, and and so then you have this idea, and and how do you take it to the next step? Where where did you start? Yeah, so um, I looked for I need I knew I needed a team, so I looked for ways to get a team, and I knew about the IBM's call for code challenge because yeah, it's it's huge, so. Um, I found that uh, Slack channel, enrolled in that Slack channel and looked in there and there were like many, many, like thousands um, of people who didn't have a team and who wanted to join some team. So I recru recruited the team members from there. And also mm -hmm. I found some one or two at LinkedIn. Um, but uh, these were amazing team members, you know, we didn't know each other at all. And they were from all over the world. And uh, so we, you know, we joined the team and we built a team. It's, um, and they were actually, they stayed for the long haul. I mean, they're still with me. We still want to work together, like onwards uh, with the Hero Loop. And yeah, it's just, you know, if you have an idea, don't uh, let it, anything stop you, I think, because just go with the attitude that it, it's going to work. It's going to work out and the people around you, they'll help you. So um, they'll help you get the job done. So just reach out to people and go for it. Yeah, yeah. well, I think that's a great first piece of advice for everyone who is walking around with an idea in their head, but not sure uh, where to start. Yeah. And, and yeah. well, I've, I've met some of your, your team members as well. And indeed, they're amazing to see the enthusiasm and, and see how you're all working together. Um, but I can also imagine that it must be strange to to never met in person and and how how did you do that to work together on this this project without being able to meet face to face? Yeah, so I think that it's a mindset somehow. Like I've been taught to I'm I was I've been a consultant in many um, like diverse businesses and. Uh, I grew up uh, going to international schools with like people from 40 countries. So for me, it's like normal uh, state. I also been working with for 20 years with people across the world. It's normal state for me, this uh, way of working. And so, um, so, so you had like to, video calls to, to bond yeah, together? Yeah, <laughs> it was a bit, bit like difficult because of the time difference so that's oh, yes, but we made yeah we made sure to have like the meeting uh, when everyone could join it was around dinner time at my place because we have some people in india and some people in mexico usa and so um but because also we had this microservices set up it works well because everybody can work with their own field so it's like not one doesn't really require everyone to work together, like pair programming and things. One can do one's own thing, like uh, one, one's own track. And then, but there are also things like electricity outages in different countries and floods and, you know, lots of things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a little bit cumbersome for these people in my team because their batteries died and they couldn't work before the next day or things like that happen. And that's, those things are not so common, uh, but everybody are working from home. so. It's uh, there's no yeah. like backup electricity or anything like that. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's from, uh, some of the challenges uh, you faced. And I'm, I'm just curious, uh, how did you celebrate uh, together when you heard that you won the, the regional prize for Cover Code in Europe? Uh, we had a meeting like uh, that evening and <laughs> we usually, or we, we put on music I think it was cool and the gang so, uh, celebration. <laughs> it's funky, funky song from the eighties or something. And uh, I was wearing my red hat. I have a red hat. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, I have a red yeah. hat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so we were partying, like, like talking about the vision, what we want to do when we when COVID nineteen is over, and we want to meet up. We want to go skiing together. 
I've taught a team of Indians to ski at the former employer I was with, and uh, they they made it in three months. So they were all excited. We're going to go skiing together in some mountain somewhere when COVID-19 is over. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's a great uh, thing to to look forward with uh, with the team. Yeah, and and as we're looking forward now, um, so so can you tell a little bit about um, yeah what you're currently working on with the Hero Loop? Uh, any any challenges yeah, yeah. that you're facing? Yeah. Tell so we more. have my team is very like deep tech people. They're super like uh, persistent and long. You know. Uh, they fight hard with all the problems we get. Um, they, I can always trust them to solve it. They're amazing. So, uh, but we we're having design thinking workshops because we need to also look forward, like what's going to happen uh, after MVP one is um, published. Like, um, I mean, run into production. So, <clears throat> we have. Um, we also got this amazing prize from IBM called for Code. Uh, where they, where you guys will help us with uh, going to production. So that's amazing. That's up next. And then after that, we've we've actually already had competed in the Nordic Smart City Hack um, and won that hackathon. Um, and we'll help get help from the European Commission, Swedish Institute, and the City of Helsingborg to also wow. scale not only technical. We get the help from you, IBM, to like scale worldwide technical, like making sure that we do go the right way and use best, best practices. But uh, it's also help with scaling like out there to people, like reaching communities, uh, governments, uh, businesses, universities out there. So um, we, our new idea is to create like uh, hero circles where you live. And uh, for every good deed that a hero does, they get rated and they receive hero tokens. And these hero tokens oh, wow. can be exchanged to hero coupons at your local store. So oh. yeah. so in that way, you're well, also supporting the local uh, stores out there. Oh yeah. And so we uh, up after this, we're thinking of how we're gonna help governments. And after that, we'll help uh, universities somehow. So this, this is the first business track where that we won actually we won, we won that uh, idea in this nordic smart uh, city hack so we're super happy for that but uh yeah thank you yeah yeah i i, I can imagine that if you're already winning two prizes uh shortly after each other must be very motivating for uh for all of you to uh to continue yeah yeah and um yeah so so you have all these um these plans for for future um how yeah how do you think it will will continue do you think that like in a year from now everyone in, in europe or maybe even around the world uh can be can be a hero or is that too optimistic or can we start earlier already what do you think? i wish yes i really like we're all working so hard every day uh, and you know, my team is crowdsourced. It's uh, everyone are giving out their free time in our work, in our project. So we're working every day to see like the world full of heroes and full of loopers in one year's time. So we cannot do this on our own. We're just a simple startup. We have great ideas and a great team. We need help from everyone like out there to make this happen. Like we need help from the heroes, the loopers, individuals. We need help from governments. We need help from businesses. We need help from universities. We'll make it happen. We'll we'll code it, but we need to cooperate, everyone, to make this, you know, us arise from this COVID-19. So uh, I'm thinking um, our focus is like um, to make this ecosystem for all people can help each other uh, in various ways, uh, like to rise back from this COVID-19. We want to do it, to help everyone do it faster. So we'll do our very best in every way to make it possible, but we need help from everyone. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think this is also a good moment to say that for everyone who is curious to know more about uh, all the things you're working on, that they just go to your website, thehoroloop.com, to uh, find out uh, more. And, and I think there you can also uh, enroll if you want to, to volunteer. So uh, definitely yeah. inviting yeah. everyone to, uh, to have a look there. Yeah. So, yes. so I'll bring, spent a, the time I'll bring my goes really my fast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> so so just to, to close is there one final uh, piece of advice that you want to give everyone starting on their own ideas or yeah just a final word from uh, from you yeah so persistence um you know you need to make up your mind you're gonna f cross the finish line the finish line is not before one year it's like so every you know mountain you climb you have to keep going even though it's everything you know it's nighttime it's your you have bruises on your uh, feet uh whatever you have to keep going you got to get up to that mountain top so you just you know go there get your team with you and then you know press on and get up there so uh, but uh, when you're up there, we're hoping for a helicopter to come and get us to get us down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, we're hoping that it's going to fly for everyone everywhere. Yeah, yeah, well, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for Aventa for uh, for joining me here uh, here today. And, uh, Thank and thanks so everyone for, uh, for watching. Um, if you get enthusiastic and as said, want to know more about the Hero Loop, visit uh, theheroloop.com. Or uh, if you would like to know more about any of the other open source projects that are out there related to Call for Code, you can visit developer.ibm.com forward slash Call for Code. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for watching. Um, Bente, best of luck. Uh, fun as Thank well. You. I think all will be fine. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, thanks Berta, thanks Stephanie. I think uh, that there are some really cool insights in how we can help with hackathons also to make a better world. And yeah, I also can only can recommend to everyone to join as many hackathons as your time allows. And um, yeah, Sebastian, maybe your take on that. Yeah, thank you so much, Seat. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I can just emphasize, re-emphasize what you said. You know, hackathons these days, or you know, starting last year with, I guess, we versus virus, right? This was the biggest one, uh, sort of, you know, also from from public, from government, and so. And it's all really aimed about doing doing good stuff, doing uh, doing good for the world. So, um, yeah, I can also just say, um, join join hackathons uh, if you have the time. Join the call for code, uh, as Miriam said, uh, it's running all the year, and um, yeah, as uh, maybe as already emphasized, you know, you don't need to be a developer. You can just bring an idea to really start creating or changing, changing the world, making it better. Yeah, maybe you become a developer afterwards. True, um, good point. Yeah, with that uh, session, actually, we are coming to an end. So let's basically wrap it up a bit shortly. So what we have basically learned today and what we saw is we have talked about developer advocacy. Um, what's very interesting because, um, because you can actually reach out to developer advocates also at IBM to um, get kickstarted your own projects, get some MVPs built, everything for free. That's, that, that's very cool. We talked about responsible computing. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the call for code, which basically um, is a project that helps, um, yeah, basically where developers help making a better world and, and work on on, on topics and solutions for topics such as water pollution, hunger and climate change, which is, which is very nice. Um, very interesting, we saw a demo of self-driving cars powered by IBM Watson. We also saw basically the vending machine, so I just want to remind everyone uh, you can win some nice goodies, socks and t-shirts by using by building a short chatbot in five to ten minutes and basically getting some goodies back for it. It's also a very funny thing, I, uh, I would say. Um, we actually also had bad news because we saw that we are not going to use these ones the next days, but these ones. So that's, that's basically the information that we got from the Veda company. 
uh, with a better forecast. Um, what what did I miss, Sebastian? What what would you like to add? Yeah, of course, not to forget quantum, right? I mean, quantum exactly. is one an important piece of our, of our entire innovation innovation mission. Um, and uh, I mean, quantum as the other things that we do, many of the things that we do are open source, like the QuizKit, uh, the, the API, you know, used to develop uh, quantum uh, quantum algorithms or quantum solutions. Um, it's it's uh, Python based, yeah. Um, so uh, the other thing, um, maybe if I can uh, emphasize um, emphasize on, on our mission, maybe to summarize, uh, if possible. Um, thank you, thanks for the slide. Well, um, this really s maybe sums it up or summarizes, I, I think, pretty well what what we what we can offer you as a developer. Um, you see, the call for code is part of our mission. So social and good tech hackathons, really part of our mission. Um, it's free to join. You have the chance to really make an impact to the world by developing. Uh, Good tech together with with others that you don't know yet. Yeah, so you can join a team and create something that really helps the world getting better uh, with with many many uh, bad situations. Um, the hybrid cloud and AI virtual meetups that we do and um, that you can find also on Crowdcast. So as I said last year we did 200 plus free enablement sessions and we have these these learning journey approach. So everything that we try with regards to skilling and, and upskilling and enablement is really in a learning journey. So wherever you are on, on your skill level, we can, we hope, we can, we can try, you know, to get you a step further. And it's not only about having the meetups, joining meetups, you can reach out, as I said, to us, you know, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, talk to us, you know, reach out to, to our advocates and get the questions and answers, uh, the questions uh, answered that you need with office hours that we can, uh, that we can bring to the table, um, whiteboarding sessions we can do. We do all these things for free of charge because we would like, you know, to really bring, use technology to go to the step further. And uh, if you could have the slide one more time, please. Um, you know, and you have maybe uh, recognized there is on the left hand side in, in the dark in the dark side of the mission. There is also these 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 um, this joint uh, ISV GSI workshops. So we basically invite ISVs. We invite you as the developers to come on stage. We do the marketing around all these things. You can present what you do with IBM technologies. So uh, if you would like, for instance, to learn enter a totally new ecosystem or if you like us you know to invite our customers our partners worldwide and you can present what you did what you coded what you developed with ibm technologies then you we are happy to set this up we did this many times already in the last year and on the right side on the right hand side you see this these one-on-one -on -one partner engagements um, you can you can become an IBM partner, and then it's you know we do free of charge MVP building for instance. So for instance, we can over over 20 weeks together develop um, develop a new totally new solution that you can bring to market later on. Yeah. So we spend not only the funding by for instance cloud credits, but we spend resources really manpower to code something together. Well, thanks again for the uh, for the for the information. Um, yeah, I mean, with that said, I would say it was a very nice day. So it was really cool to get some insights in what you were doing. And uh, as I already mentioned a couple of times also in the morning show, uh, I hope that we can see each other, um, Sebastian, also in person uh, soon at some point in the future and maybe get also some hands on stuff. Uh, with these uh, kind of projects, uh, I already I'm already chatting with uh, with Francis on LinkedIn to kind of uh, yeah uh, take my slot for the demo for the live demo in in, in Munich, and yeah with that said we are coming back to uh, to to the end of today. Sebastian, thanks again. Thank you. Um, we will see each other definitely uh, later again. And for all the other people out there, there is some announcement that we still want to make. Uh, so first of all, thanks very much to Vienna Up, which is a, a partner of us for these events happening uh, these days. And uh, it's basically an event, uh, one of the largest uh, startup uh, events in, in, in Europe. Uh, to, to, tomorrow is the last day, 12th of May, so check, uh, check it out, viennaup.com. Obviously, these events are happening virtually, so you can join from anywhere from the world. Um, we are also going uh, again live tomorrow with our DevOps day. So first of all, we will have a workshop in the morning uh, about smoke testing. Um, so check out realdevelopers.com slash live, uh, register for the workshop. And we will also have four awesome sessions afterwards in the afternoon. So again, realdevelopers.com slash live, check it out. Uh, very nice 
And um, in the recap, we are going to talk about uh, blockchain. We have the Bitcoin SV DEFCON 2021 going on, uh, on Saturday and on Sunday. So here as well, realdevelopers.com slash live and check out the program. There is like many, 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 many sessions, like two days full packed of, of, of sessions that might be of, of interest for you. And last but not least, as I said in the very beginning, the Rio Developers World Congress 2021 is coming back uh, with amazing speakers, Tim Berners-Lee, Jeff Atwood, uh, Mishko Heavery, Brenda Romero, John Romero, many, many others. Uh, we'll talk about a wide range of topics that are interesting for developers. So check it out, realdevelopers.com slash world minus Congress. Get your early bird ticket and um, hope to see you then again. With that said, thank you very much for joining um, and see you, actually see you tomorrow at the DevOps day, right? So um, have a nice rest of the day and bye bye. Have a good one, bye. job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130k. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.